Another member has joined Mercedes compact car family, says our car tester, Ines Petri. The most recent addition is the CLA shooting brake. There's not much difference between the CLA shooting brake and the four-door coupe version until you get to the back of the car. The roof line flows like the coupe to the rear. Mercedes describes the CLA shooting brake as a lifestyle station wagon, and we're going to find out what that means. As far as design goes, Mercedes laid an important foundation in 2012 with the new A-Class. That was a shift from a conservative image to a younger target group. The plan worked. Mercedes has managed to attract new and younger customers. And with a CLA shooting brake, Mercedes has brought the idea of the lifestyle station wagon, familiar from the bigger CLS shooting brake, to the compact class. The CLA shooting brake is the fifth member of our compact car family, says Jochen Eck from Mercedes. It extends the line using the basic idea of the CLS shooting brake. So it's a design-oriented sporty car with a large practical hatch and a perfect addition to the range. There are two diesel and four gasoline engines to choose from. We're testing the all-wheel drive CLA 250 shooting brake with 155 kilowatts and dual clutch transmission. Packing 350 newton meters of torque, the car accelerates from zero to 100 kilometers an hour in 6.8 seconds with a top speed of 240 kilometers an hour. Driven gently, Mercedes puts consumption at 6.6 .6 liters over 100 kilometers. This button switches between different modes, says Ines, so you can have a really sporty ride. The front of the shooting brake boasts all the hallmarks of the compact class. The limited orange art edition adds extra design details, like orange angel eyes in the bison on headlights, and dashes of color on the front grille surround and on the alloy wheels. In profile, the flat window design is striking. The low greenhouse is how the salespeople describe it. The flowing form isn't just striking and modern, it's also pretty unbeatable when it comes to air resistance. With a drag coefficient of 0.26, the CLA has set a new standard for a car of its class. But just how practical is the design really? And what does the sleek design cost in terms of space and visibility? Ina says the design does affect the driver's all-round vision a little. A glance in the rearview mirror shows how small the hatch window is. And if you get a little too close to the traffic lights, the roof can obstruct the view. The interior is also sporty and striking. Metallic trimmings on the steering wheel and the round air vents suggest power and strength. And if you splash out the extra 6,500 euros for the orange art edition, you can expect colorful accents inside too. Like the orange contrasting top stitching on the performance seats, which are upholstered with leather and microfiber. The contrast on the seat belts is an eye catcher too. Ina says there's little difference between the height of the CLA shooting brake compared to the four-door coupe. You have to watch your head a little, but once you're in, there's enough head and leg room. And the trunk offers a reasonable amount of luggage space. There's up to 1,354 liters with the rear seats folded down. In Germany,
Germany, the CLA shooting break has a starting price of around 30,000 euros. Collision prevention and attention assists come as standard. Mercedes shooting brake is aimed at fans of competing Audi and VW models. Our tester says opinions may differ on whether or not the CLA shooting brake is a classical station wagon or not. But one thing's clear, this new Mercedes certainly stands out. So if a sedan's a little too conservative for you and a station wagon's too boxy, the CLA shooting brake provides an interesting alternative. Today our test driver Reinhold Deisenhofer is going to give us some tips on how to drive safely in snow and in the mountains. More and more SUVs with all-wheel drive are on the road, including family-oriented station wagons, like the Seat Leon Experience. But Reinhold underscores that even all-wheel drive can't repeal the laws of physics. It's a big help when starting up on snow or ice, but braking is another matter. If you're starting out on a slippery surface, Reinhold recommends putting the car in second gear to keep your wheels from spinning. Second gear puts less torque on the driving wheels. And during your drive too, shift up early, even if the engine struggles a bit. For the same reason, you don't want your wheels to spin. High RPMs should be taboo with a cold engine anyway. Just after starting, many moving parts are not optimally lubricated yet, and that means increased wear. Our car tester says that if you drive lots of short distances, especially in winter, you should check your oil frequently, because if the engine doesn't warm up properly, fuel and condensation water can mix in with the oil, and that reduces the oil's lubricating capacity, increasing wear. Whether winter or summer, it's better to change your oil frequently than to risk damage to your engine. In snow or ice, use your brakes as seldom as possible. It's better to use the engine brake. If the car has cruise control, don't use it in such weather. Using the brakes shuts cruise control off, and that increases the danger of skidding. If you're not confident about how you handle a car in cold conditions, says Reinhold, just find an open space and test how your vehicle responds on ice or snow. Practice steering and braking and get a feel for controlling the car in these conditions. This is especially advisable if you've rented a car for a ski trip and are not yet on familiar terms with it. Avoid stopping on a slope because starting up again is harder uphill. Reinhold has a tip if you do have to stop on an incline, put the foot mats under the driving wheels. Then gently roll forward. Don't pick up speed too fast because your passenger has to retrieve the mats. But the all-wheel drive Seat Leon experience can manage slopes. In snow packed down by traffic, keep a close eye on where you drive. Hazardous sheets of ice can form under the snow. If you do find yourself on ice, don't panic, says Reinhold. Don't jerk the steering wheel back and forth. Don't brake suddenly. Just steer very gently to the right or left to give your tires a chance to grip the road again. And a car like the Seat Leon Experience, your electronic assistance will help you. Be especially careful at intersections. Braking cars have packed the surface and make it slick. So keep more distance from the vehicle in front of you and brake gently and early. If you are driving with ABS, you'll have to floor the brakes and steer carefully. Einold has one more tip. Getting up the hill is one thing, but you'll have to come back down. If your car starts sliding, the wheels are blocked. Ease up on the brakes. Your automatic control systems don't function unless they recognize that the wheels are turning enough to move the car at three kilometers an hour. Only then can they help out.
The new Cayman GT4 is perfect for someone who wants a sporty, puristic car, says our car tester Klaus Nietzwitz. Key says Klaus is the state-of-the-art mid-mounted engine found in today's sports cars and Formula One race cars. Klaus admires the GT4's whopping 385 horsepower and explains that its aerodynamic package provides down thrust, keeping the wheels firmly on the ground. That's essential on a racetrack, and that's where he is. The ignition is on the left side. Klaus loves the sound of 385 horsepower and 420 newton meters of torque and can't wait to feel them as well. Klaus is on the demanding racetrack in Porto Mal, Portugal. It's no easy task for a driver or for the undercarriage. Before starting, he turns off all the electronic assistance to see what the car can do without them. So, before it goes, I turn off all the electronic assistance. And then it will be very clear what the auto in Sachen Fahrwerk so drauf hat. The Cayman GT4 is now the entry model to the GT family. It's the first GT sports car in Porsche Cayman series and has immediately become the benchmark for sportiness in its segment. Klaus says the extremely tight steering reminds him of a real race car. Steering into a curve is very precise. Klaus says you can take the curves with no uncertainty. When you turn and step on the gas, it oversteers a little bit, but remains well under control. Accelerating out of a long right curve, our car tester feels the down thrust on the front and rear axles. The car produces more than 100 kilograms of down thrust at speeds of 280 or 290 kilometers an hour. Now he takes the straight at 245. The Cayman GT4 has the genes of its big brother, the 911 GT3. That's where it gets its chassis, braking system, and front spoiler. The 3.8 liter six cylinder engine with 283 kilowatts comes from the 911 Carrera S. The Cayman GT4 accelerates from 0 to 100 kilometers an hour in just 4.4 seconds. Klaus is fascinated by how, in a six-gear manual transmission, the electronics rev the engine when shifting down, which makes the shift smoother and simpler. This radical two-door sports car masters the circuit. A debut with a drum roll. The GT4 needed seven minutes and 40 seconds to round the Nürburgring North Loop. With the GT4, Porsche proves once again that it knows how to build exceptional sports cars in any class. And the Porsche Track Precision app, which comes with the optional Sport Chrono package, allows drivers to train their time with their smartphones. Graphic displays show times and driving dynamics. Porsche engineer Eduard Schultz shows how a smartphone monitor displays the analysis with detailed telemetric data on speeds, steering, braking, and gas pedal positions. The video can be started anywhere and provides synchronous driving data. The system is easy to operate and Schultz is sure any customer can immediately understand it and how he has driven. The Cayman GT4 is the lowest priced car in Porsche's GT family. The street legal racing car can be had for just under 86,000 euros. Our test driver sums up, the Cayman GT4 is fun, especially on a racetrack, but also for going to your local bakery. It costs about 85,700 euros, and at that price, Klaus wants to go for another spin. Modern materials, new construction methods, and an advanced look. 
1967, this car looked like something from the future. The Bear K67 prototype played a decisive role in the manufacture of the following generations of mass-produced cars. A long hood with twin headlamps and a short trunk, and the whole thing packaged in a striking signal color. That was standard for sports cars in the late 1960s. But the Bear K67 was never meant to compete with Porsche or Alfa Romeo. It was a pointer to the use of plastics in car design. The chemicals giant Bear is based in Leverkusen between Dusseldorf and Cologne. Along with medicines and pesticides, it makes quality plastics. Bear's Peter Neuwald says polyurethane was invented here in Leverkusen more than 75 years ago. It took a long time, though, before people realized what they could use this new material for. Bayer was in charge of project management when this car was developed. It took on the marketing, too, and presented the car at the Hanover Trade Fair in 1967, which explains the name. What's really special? Even the chassis is a polyurethane sandwich case without any metal reinforcement at all. There were plastic cars previously, but they had a frame of steel tubing. The K67 was stable enough without that. This contemporary footage shows the material undergoing stress testing. No changes after six million repetitions. The continuous testing proved how stable the fiberglass reinforced plastic chassis was. This advanced technology needed to be packaged attractively. That was important for the makers of the K67. The look of the car was down to Hans Gugelow, a professor of design who had already made a name for himself with other projects. He had designed an overhead railway for the city of Hamburg. He didn't live to see the production of the car he designed. He died in 1965. Even though it was a prototype, Gugelow's creation looks like a properly developed mass-produced sports car, from the long hood to the sharp trunk with its perpendicular rear. The round rear lights were provided by the company that delivered the mechanical side of the car. With its know-how in plastics, Bayer was able to build a car chassis and the other parts of the shell. But the company turned to BMW for the other technology needed in car making. The first test drives of the naked chassis with engine and undercarriage took place in 1965, and they took place on public roads, despite the fact that most of the body of the car had not been built yet. But the test car mastered it all, even these steep bends on an old section of West Berlin's racetrack, the Avos. Hans-Peter Neuwald is a little more gentle with the K67 now. The Google designed car is even more striking today than it was almost 50 years ago. BMW proved to be the ideal partner to manufacture a sports car. Bears Hans-Peter Neuwald says he's certain that the company discussed the project with many other car makers. But they managed to convince BMW because the concept suited the BMW's company strategy and because BMW had the necessary know-how and resources. The two-liter four-cylinder engine with two twin carburetors were also used in BMW's 2000 Ti sedan. The gears and axles came from Munich, too. But Bayer is registered as the maker of the K67. The interior of this sports coupe is plain, but innovative. The 
Neuwald says the interior contained the first injection molded dashboard. Back then, the cockpit of a car was still hard and solid. Baer demonstrated how you could design the interior to be attractive, more convenient, and above all, safer. The K67 heralded a new field of business for Baer. The company has been working closely with the automobile industry for the past half century. It's developed and produced parts made of different plastics for manufacturers around the world. But the K67 also demonstrated that a car made entirely of plastic made little sense. The K67 is very important for Bayer. It helped us reach the conclusion that the optimal combination of technology and different materials is the best way to approach things. Nowadays, about 50% of a car is made of plastics, and that's set to rise. The K67 demonstrated 50 years ago how plastics could be used in car making. This car is the only remaining prototype.